I had a, a similar concern, um, and, and certainly it could be something that our committee can tackle at some point in terms of one of our subcommittees or even making recommendations. Um, but to add on to this, I, I, I was kind of struck by um, your slide that said um, prospective donors sh shall appear to be in good health. Um, and then the question, feeling healthy and, and well today. When I saw those phrases, um, I, I thought it kind of interesting in contra to this, it's, it's sort of when you think about patients with this illness, um, Deja Buckwald and others, some of whom are on this committee, have found that the functional limitations of patients with this condition are among the more serious with different chronic conditions. So how anybody with an actively diagnosed um, ME-CFS could potentially be feeling healthy and well is beyond my kind of comprehension to try to even get my hands around. Um, you know, we have a, a very um, severely impacted group of individuals. If that's the case, how does one justify um, sort of not thinking about the fact that this is not a healthy group? Um, and again, this, this question might certainly go beyond you and, and the committees that you're on and might ultimately be something that our committee needs to deal with, but I'd be interested in your reaction to the just juxtaposition between these two concepts of feeling healthy and well versus a group that by all accounts and research is one of the most disabled groups we can find compared to just about any other condition. Well, that, that's very tough. And, um, you know, I think that, first of all, I think that, you, that everyone around the table here has to understand that we rely on volunteer donors for our blood supply, okay? And so having volunteer donors, we expect them also to give us correct answers. And that's always a challenge. I think it's very difficult when you start pinpointing a group of individuals. And, um, and I think that, you know, we, we need to be able to pinpoint the, um, the disease and um, the, the um, symptoms along with the disease. But I, I, I agree with you. I think it's very difficult that someone that would have chronic fatigue syndrome would even present themselves to a, a blood bank for donation. Um, but I think that one of the things that we have uh, that our job is to be able to make sure that the blood bank community is very aware of some of the discussions that we are having with the chronic fatigue syndrome um, patient groups and also the scientific bodies. And as we move forward with the epidemiology, it is even more, uh, more important that they are aware as we move along to be able to make the right decision on how should their medical directors screen the donors if, if there is someone that comes forward. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that, like you said, screening donors is extremely difficult. And um, you're relying on a human being to give you accurate answers. But um, uh, we do have mechanisms in place that we could also provide education to the donor based on um, what we know. And so there's not only an interviewing process, but there's potential of giving the potential donor um, reading inf information on uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. I love that answer. Because we're trying to find every way we can to get into the broader community and say this is entity exists and you should know about it. And if we could use blood donors as one more missionary out into the community to teach about chronic fatigue, that would be lovely. But my question um, actually comes back again to this donation thing. First, as a clinician, I'll say many patients go through long periods of wellness and then relapse. And I think they're absolutely, if, if there's a retrovirus underneath all of this, my patients are, many of my patients are very civically conscious and want to do the right thing. And if they felt well enough to donate blood, they would and they do donate blood. And I, I think that, and I can tell you, they do donate blood. 
and I'm always cautioning them not to because of my second statement, and this is for the webinar people, all you chronic fatigue people out there, your blood volumes are already low. What on earth would you give another unit of blood for? That's a bad thing to do. And if there's some way to say on that little CDC thing that I wouldn't have read all the way through, hey, it's bad for you to donate blood, just that simple statement alone. And, oh, by the way, we don't know if there's something infectious in there or not. Chronic fatigue may or may not be XMRV associated or a subgroup may well be. But there are other viruses we're dealing with, and, and some of them we're very concerned are oncogenic. And, and I would really not like my patients to donate blood. Galen? Just a very quick follow-up to that, and that is, is that I think that, uh, again, those of us who remember when we used to, in college, sell a unit of blood for money to go out on dates, and they stopped that sort of thing for the obvious uh, public health reasons, and then the blood donation was replaced by people who wanted to help other people. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine uh, a chronic fatigue syndrome patient, even by history, or anyone else who might have a blood-borne illness potential to transfer to someone else if they were adequately warned would stand up and say, I don't care, I want to donate anyway. I, I've never met in all my years of a chronic fatigue syndrome patient who would ever war uh, wish their uh, illness on their absolute worst enemy. So it seems to me that just going along with what Nancy says, if with your information, getting that out there further, a simple this could be a problem with, uh, and, and XMRV is the, is the latest infectious agent. It's certainly not the first. That information alone, I think, would take care of 99 plus percent of the potential donors who only are doing it because they think they're doing something good for their fellow mankind. I, let me just comment by saying, I, I, Nancy, I fully agree with what you, what you mentioned and then also, um, Dr. Marshall, your, your comment. Um, I think that um, there is a responsibility for the clinicians to be able to communicate to their patients and to express. Um, you know, we can do a certain amount of getting information out there. The advocacy groups for chronic fatigue can get the word out, but also the clinician needs to be able to uh, counsel the, the patient and talk about the limitations, as, as you mentioned, with the blood volume. I think it's very critical that they, they, they look at their health and their well-being of their health uh, first. Secondly, if I could just put a plug that um, um, we have been trying investigating uh, ways of uh, pathogen reduction technology um, for this country. Uh, Europe has a certain amount of pathogen reduction with uh, platelets and plasma. And um, I think that I look at this as a silver bullet. I hope that someday we could be able to have a, a pathogen reduction agent that we can add to the blood or blood products that would kill all the potential pathogens. Uh, are we there at the present time? No. FDA has some concerns about some of the studies that have been done on the pathogen reductions. But I think that it's one of the areas that we need to continue to research so that we're not always chasing the next pathogen and so that we have a response to make sure that our blood supply is safe. 